All right. Um, I'll just first start by saying thank you so much and welcome to you who, uh, those of you who've joined us here at the forum. And if you have not gotten a headset, please grab one because we'll be speaking both in English and Chinese for this session and you'll want to understand everything that's being said. So please grab a headset if you have one and um, please also refrain from using your device because that is distracting to the people near you who are trying to follow along in both languages. Um, let's see, so we're ready? We're ready. Thanks also for those of, it, of those of you who are joining us over the internet all around the world. So we're here to talk about fisheries and aquaculture and the future of sustainability and fisheries and aquaculture. I'll first introduce myself and the panel. We will have a discussion about the topic for maybe about half of the session, two thirds of the session, and then we'll open up the topic to questions from the audience. Um, when, you, when, you answer the question, when you ask us a question, please say who you are and where you're from as well. All right, let's do this. So thanks very much for joining us again. I'm Kristen Marhaver. I'm going to be the moderator today. I'm a marine biologist running a research lab in the Southern Caribbean at a research station called Karmabi. It's basically a marine bio biological institute on the island of Curacao in the Southern Caribbean. And my specialty is trying to figure out how to help corals grow and rebuild coral reefs and how to assess their health and how to understand what they need in order to thrive and recover in the seas of the future. So I think a lot about growing juvenile organisms and assessing the health of organisms, and those are actually the areas of expertise of our, panels, our panelists here today. So our panelists, to my left is Mr. Wu, Mr. Wu Hogang. He is the chair and president of Zoneco Group, which is a major fisheries enterprise here in China. It is the largest producer of scallops in the entire country, and they're a specialist in the reproduction and the seeding and the harvest, the processing of scallops and other seafood. And they also recently became, with the scallop fishery, the first fishery in China to be certified by the Marine Stewardship Council, which is not a small achievement um, at all. And to his left is, um, is Ms. Abby Ramanan. She is, has multiple hats here at the forum. She is a uh, co-chair of the entire meeting. She's presenting on a number of different topics. She's a social entrepreneur. She's started two businesses. I think she's on her third. And she's currently the CEO and co-founder of Impact Vision, which is a company that's using computer vision and hyperspectral imaging and machine learning to assess the quality of uh, food chains, the quality of food in the food chain. And that includes a system to test the freshness of seafood. So the idea is to apply technology to reduce waste, to increase accountability, to reduce fraud, and overall increase the value of food in the food chain. So we have some ambitious entrepreneurs here, some ambitious business people here, and they're primarily focused on how to grow productivity and efficiency in, in food chains as they exist now. But we're also going to talk today about what the food chains might look like in the future. I will very quickly introduce the topic of fisheries and aquaculture for those of you who are coming in with a very green, a green perspective, although I suspect that there are some experts in the room as well. Um, about one billion people worldwide depend on ocean fisheries for their primary source of protein. So this is no small topic, and global fisheries are worth about $150 billion a year. Now despite that, uh, that importance, we're also running out of fish. About 85% of fish stocks in the world are either at or beyond their sustainable harvest limits. And the ability to maintain that sustainability is compromised by the fact that somewhere between 15 and 30% of all fisheries catch worldwide is what's called IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, and unregulated, or as some people just say, pirate fishing. So the, the impact of IUU fishing on economies is something like 20, 10 to $20 billion of lost value per year. So given the challenges in wild fisheries, many people are saying, well, then we should obviously turn to farming and to aquaculture. But just like farming on land, that sort of thing doesn't come without its costs. The clearing of land and the clearing of coastal terrain to, to do aquaculture is extraordinarily damaging oftentimes. Aquaculture is resource intensive, it takes a lot of antibiotics, a lot of feed. In some cases, you're talking about three pounds or three kilos of wild caught fish fed to an aquaculture species to get one pound or one kilo of fish back out. So it's not necessarily even a, a, a a profitable enterprise in terms of the energetics. And when you are farming species in, in close quarters and in high densities, you tend to have disease outbreaks, the accumulation of heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, 
there are some real threats to the health of those kinds of food supplies. So we need to feed the world, and we need to feed it with the resources we have here on this planet, and we have challenges in both wild fisheries and aquaculture. We're not going to feed the world without both. So our challenge today is to talk about how we can increase the sustainability of both of those things. And that's not only to increase productivity and efficiency in markets, but it's also, in fact, a human rights issue and a geopolitical stability issue. The more that we have stable fisheries, the better we are able to prevent fisheries collapse, uh, political unrest, the emergence of piracy. And the more that we are able to bring fisheries into an accountable and a transparent world, the more we're able to reduce the negative effects of illegal fishing, which include things like narcotics trafficking and human slavery. So with that extremely heavy introduction, um, I'm going to start by asking my panelists a very serious and very weighty question, which is, um, tell me your favorite kind of seafood to eat. <laughs> Would you like to start, Abby? Yeah, absolutely. I am a pescatarian, um, and definitely when I'm in China, and I have to say my favorite is probably sashimi. Just go straight to the sauce. Mm. Any kind? Any particular favorite? Tuna. Tuna. Yeah. Tuna sashimi. Tuna sashimi. And Mr. Wu, would you like to tell us your favorite type of seafood to eat? Sunday. A uh, scallop. Scallops. <laughs> Say that. <laughs> The reason I ask that question is because oftentimes we think about sustainability or environmental conservation as an effort to not do something, to not eat seafood, but I think all of us on this stage are partly in this effort to eat more seafood. My particular favorite is a wahoo caught off the back of a fishing boat in the Caribbean and then just chopped up and made into ceviche with some lime juice. And then you eat it with your bare hands. Okay, let's get to the serious questions. So I'd like to give our panelists an um, opportunity to talk a little bit about the work that they do. So I'd like to ask you each to describe a recent success that's helping put us on the path to greater sustainability in fisheries. And that can be an example from your own work or something that's close to you. Mr. Wu, would you like to start by talking about the scallop fishery? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just now you talk about your favorite seafood. And I think this type of interaction, uh, if you have no seafood to eat, maybe you will not feel happy. And for our company, we have 60 years of uh, history. And uh, within all our development, uh, we have our fish catching stage. You know, this is mainly we're taking the benefit from the ocean. And uh, the next stage is that we have our own cultivation of the fishery uh, so that we were able to get the uh, growth and the production of the seafood. So later on, we're coming to the third stage which is the current stage, that is the equal development stage. And we're trying to establish a very careful development of the sea so that we can achieve good productivity and good uh, marine environment. And we've got the MSC license in China for the very first time in 2015. It has uh, three major uh, principles. First of all, sustainability. Uh, secondly, uh, the biodiversity. And thirdly, is the good industry practice. With all our endeavor, not only we've got this license, we also created the biggest uh, farming area in the sea. Not only we've got the scallop, we also have the product of sea cucumber, abalone, the sea chestnut, and then conch, and so on. So within our fishery farms, we have a great variety of biodiversity. And not only with this uh, product, we also attract a lot of uh, uh, sea animals coming to our uh, fisheries. You know, we have for many years to grow the scallop, and this is the very good sustainable way to the specific environment of the fishery area and also for the general idea. 
of the things that I, I think is worth mentioning as a marine biologist, I can tell you that some of the species he's talking about, things like scallops and conch and, and um, uh, sea cucumbers, are organisms that eat smaller organisms, and they tend to be filter feeders, and they tend to be detritivores. So those are the kind of organisms that are better to be raised in aquaculture than others. And, and the description of other species coming and joining that ecosystem is very cool. So would you like to ex give an example of a recent success, perhaps in your own business, and also talk to us about whether you're working on any of these kinds of same species, if you're only working on fish, yes. or also, also seafood invertebrates generally? having me on this panel. So I think there are two areas that are of particular interest where, or where there's a lot of innovation happening in relation to the seafood. So the first is the area that we work on, which is more around supply chain, transparency, and authenticity. In the US, um, up to 90% of red snapper, for example, is thought to be substituted for cheaper factory farm tilapia. In the EU, the figure is um, between 25 and 30% for uh, Pangasius and cod, but the level of fraud and substitution in the fish supply chain is one of the highest in the world. And as you alluded to earlier, there are also significant challenges with slavery and illegal fishing. This leads to depleting fish stocks in the oceans, and this has ramifications on everything from price fluctuations all the way down to an increase in sh uh, seafood allergies because of mislabeling and substitution. One of the challenges is that there is just a lack of information. So today it's a very manual process. Commercial fishing vessels will go out to sea, they'll bring back what they've caught, and uh, trained inspectors will look at the eyes and the skin of the fish in order to determine the freshness. So this means not only is knowledge concentrated in a very few number of people, it's also subjective. It's subjective, it will vary from one inspector to another. So what we have developed instead is an imaging system based on a technology called hyperspectral imaging, and this combines two different techniques. So spectroscopy, which is the technique of acquiring chemical information from a single pixel by measuring the reflectance of light combined with computer vision. And the value of having the computer vision component is that you're looking at reflectance across hundreds or thousands of pixels. What this means in practice is that you can just do inline testing because with a single pixel, it could be a lean pixel, it could be a fat pixel. It doesn't tell you something about the distribution of the parameters and having hundreds or thousands of pixels allows you to understand how the sample looks across the whole Unit. So that's just a tiny uh, primer on uh, hyperspectral imaging. And just from, we worked with one of the largest uh, fishing cooperatives in Spain on a pilot to classify the freshness of hake fish. And just from the training set alone, we got 98% uh, accuracy because as the fish age, the light reflects less skin over time. It's a function of moisture. So this essentially would allow the fish industry and that particular company to go from testing around 1% of their samples to 100%. So you can the EU classifies freshness as extra A, B, um, and non-admitted. And the goal is in order to classify every single fish in accordance with the category that it belongs to and have as little as possible as non-admitted for commercial purposes. And that's very challenging to do with sample-based tests. The other advantage of this kind of imaging system is, like I mentioned, around interspecies classification. So whether that's um, tilapia or red snapper, we even think doing a classification between Atlantic cod and Pacific cod would be possible because of how sensitive the system is. So I think there's a lot of potential in being able to identify fraud and mislabeling. There also need to be incentives put into place to, for regulators to have access into the fish supply chain because I think that today there is uh, a lot of people are benefiting um, within the industry from a high level of fraud. So just having access to the technology alone is not enough, but we are quite confident that we are able to do these types of tests today to verify both freshness and species of fish. And then the second area where I think it, what is really interesting is actually split into two. So there is a lot happening uh, around the world in cellular agriculture. So I know a couple of companies uh, in the US that are, for example, growing, taking stem cells and then fermenting them uh, outside of any kind of physical fish, growing them in labs, so essentially growing fish meat in labs as a way to circumvent some of the sustainability challenges in aquaculture and in the seafood industry. I think as with uh, cellular and plant-based meat, cellular and plant-based fish, two companies in the US are Finless Foods and New Wave Foods, taking different approaches, but essentially engineering fish outside of um, any kind of physical 
animal. I think this is a really interesting development in terms of animal protein in general. And then the second is around feed. So again, as you mentioned, it's very unsustainable to feed fish to other fish and generate lower yields than what you're putting in. So there's a lot of innovation happening around turning crop waste, for example, into fish feed so that you can raise aquaculture more sustainably in that way. And there are a few companies doing innovation in that area. So those are some innovations and approaches that I think could have quite positive impacts for, for seafood. So we have all kinds of technology. Actually, some of the hyperspectral technology you're using is originally from NASA satellite technology, looking at the health of plants and crops and Absolutely. soils now applied to fish. So we have increasing number of species and more holistic kind of aquaculture system emerging. We have technology that's now better at looking at the health and quality of species and starting to help catch people when they're faking the names of the species and, and sliding a lower quality fish into a higher quality name. I wonder what if you guys could each mention one of the major challenges you see um, either in implementation of some of the technologies we already have or, or capabilities that we don't yet have yet, that we, but that we need to increase sustainability. If you could have any, uh, any bottleneck broken open in your production or supply chain, what would it be, Mr. Wu? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, this year marks the 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening up endeavor. Uh, China enjoyed very rapid growth for its fishery industry in the past four decades. So in the early days of the reform and opening up, China struggled to provide adequate food to its population. At this stage, the government now has shifted its strategy from a quantitative-oriented strategy to a quality-oriented strategy. For fish supply, uh, so we have two primary sources. One is fishing, the other is farming. Based on the practices in recent years, uh, I think for China, we are currently at a process of transitioning from focusing on quantity to quality. There are several things we need to do. For example, China needs to give back some of the farming zones to uh, transform them back into natural habitat to strike a better balance between farming and fishing. For farming, uh, I think the future emphasis is still on techniques and technology breakthroughs. How can we enhance productivity of uh, aquaculture with implementation of technology for fishing? I think the Chinese government is now trying to reduce the number of commercial fishing vessels and also the overall output from fishing. The overarching principle uh, is to maintain a reasonable uh, scope and pace of uh, fishing. And to uh, achieve success, it is uh, still a very challenging process. But I think the overriding trend is there for us to go into this direction. I have a follow-up question about that. I wonder whether you have as many issues with fraud in um, in the types of aquaculture that you do, when you're dealing with something like a scallop or a shrimp, it's harder to disguise what it is than, say, maybe a red snapper substituted with a different fish. So I wonder how much you deal with fraud um, in the production, in, during production in the fisheries that you work on. Uh, uh, I think the Chinese consumers are becoming increasingly sophisticated. In the past, the problem is whether you can have access to seafood, and now people are paying more attention to the labeling, the uh, original production of the uh, seafood they are get getting. So for the Chinese government, um, it is implementing a uh, authentication system or tracing traceability system for the origin of production. so that the consumers can be assured of the quality of the food. For uh, food fraud, 
we uh, encountered many similar problems faced by other developing countries, including mislabeling or uh, passing uh, low-grade seafood for uh, high-grade uh, seafood. But I think the uh, situation is being improved, and uh, we are beginning to see a more transparent and fair market taking shape in China. And this, uh, in turn, can promote a healthy and orderly development of the industry. supply chain and the lack or existence of chain of custody is still a big issue in fisheries as well as many other food supplies. Um, would you like to describe a challenge that you see that you a bottleneck you wish would be broken open, whether related to something like chain of custody or the supply chain or or it could be something completely te completely technological or Yeah, absolutely. I actually based. think that with many of these emerging technologies, the technical risk can be largely reduced. Um, you can iterate on your models, you can improve the accuracy of your results. I don't think it is a technical barrier that will prevent proliferation of these tools, particularly and in the food industry and specifically in the seafood industry. I think it is largely an adoption issue. Even people within the fish industry do not know exactly where the substitution is happening. It's very opaque. Products can pass through five or six countries between being produced and be between being consumed. And we very much saw this with the explosion of the horse meat scandal, for example, when you traced that supply chain products were being um, carted uh, kind of across Europe and it was very hard to know at that point exactly where the substitution was happening. It took um, several months to even get initial results. And I think there are similar challenges with the fish industry. And there is a certain level of reluctance by various players in the supply chain to take responsibility for uh, mislabeling or substitution. Retailers want to put the emphasis on suppliers and retailers already have a huge amount of power in, in the supply chain and suppliers have you know, intense pressure because the fish industry, like all um, elements of the food industry, has fairly slim uh, profit margins, at least in countries like Europe. But at the same time, in the US, it represents $16 billion in retail sales alone and is the second largest importer of seafood in the world. So there are gains to be made from substitution. I think the economics makes sense for, for there to be, for fraud to be committed. So until we understand how we can change that incentive structure, introducing technologies um, alone is, is not going to change the way the food industry operates. And this is where I think regulation can play a really important role um, by creating, but yeah, altering the way, the, the incentives for committing fraud. There's a, the frequent desire to say, oh, if only everybody would just demand sustainable seafood at an individual level, somehow we will achieve sustainability. But what you're saying is that there's no, there's no incentive to, to play by the rules mm -hmm. each step of the way if no one else is and if your yeah. profit margin is so, exactly. so narrow. I read somewhere that about 55% uh, of all seafood imports are going only into the EU, the US, and Japan. Yeah. So it's, it is an example of an industry where there's some concentration and you, you could, in theory, establish much stronger laws about imports and custody and supply chain management at that level because you would be controlling more than 50% of import, imports around the world just with those three, those three groups. An example of where the consumer individual action may not be the place that's the most mm -hmm. squishy, the easiest place to push. Let's see. Uh, so I just want to add that uh, the growth for Chinese market, both imports and exports, uh, are, are gaining very strong momentum right now. Uh, for example, uh, we saw an average increase of 20% uh, from uh, 2016 in the year of 2017. The export grew at 16%, import grew at 33%. And uh, also uh, at international level, MSC is vigorously promoting uh, the certified products in China. And we are seeing a doubling growth of MSC certified seafood in China. 
So if uh, coupling that with uh, self-discipline of the industry, we are going to see a much bigger, uh, much better picture. The idea that you need the, the industry to be more disciplined and that the consumer will pay more for something that Absolutely. is labeled sustainable to some degree, the educated consumer groups. Is there um, a particular fishery that you wish uh, could make up a bigger portion of the exports from China? Is there a, a, a place where you see an opportunity to do even more export of higher quality product? Uh, um, I, I think China's fishery uh, industry used to be export oriented because of the higher price in overseas markets. But thanks to the rapid economic growth in domestic market, we are seeing a much more uh, demand in the domestic market. So uh, the Chinese market is attracting the best quality seafood from across the world. And uh, we are seeing also a fundamental structural change between imports and exports. So uh, abundant opportunities within China. And uh, the government is helping us to f open further to the outside world, and which is also inducive to, conducive to the international market. Idea that there's a, a constant of evolution of what uh, the, of the quality and the diversity and, and and a growth in the ability of the of the country to produce what they need and maybe even more so the idea that you're, it's more it's more food security but also potentially more exports for the international market. So ha let's see if we can ask one or two more questions and then we'll get some questions from our audience. Um, this one's a little bit provocative. Um, <laughs> Are there any technologies or um, technologies or systems in in aquaculture and sustainability that didn't live up to their promise? Is there any mis any mistakes that we have seen in the recent past that we can learn from and avoid doing again in the future as we seek greater sustainability? I might say that one of my one of my um, as a, as a conservationist and environmentalist, I often find it frustrating that we're asking an individual consumer every minute of every day to make their own individual decisions to sort of boost sustainability. I wish that there was more action at the, the regulatory and, and larger scale level. And I think in some ways we lost decades to um, asking individuals to solve the problem for us. But I wonder if there are other, say, technologies or um, species that failed to grow or, um, or, or promising things that were hyped a few years ago, but now we're saying, oh, that's not the way forward. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, would, um, I, I think in terms of a lot of the emerging technologies, we are yet to see from uh, hydroponics and aquaponics, for example, what really they can achieve in terms of yields. So I think that that is kind of remains to be seen, but I would really echo your point, and I think there are really good environmental journalist, George Monbiot, for example, who write about how it ends up being a bit of a panacea to put all the emphasis on the individual consumer to make certain choices, whether it's about reusable coffee cups or whether it's about choosing to buy sustainably sourced fish. We do need coordination at the national and international level for there to be, and it is almost becoming quite a crisis in terms of the, the fish industry, particularly around illegal fishing, slavery in the supply chain, and depleting ocean stocks. So. I would say that we need to reframe the debate. Individual consumer choice is important, but there needs to be a much more aggressive approach on addressing particularly those three areas from a policy context and from a legislative context to make you know, changes within, within our generation. So I really kind of agree with that point. I think technology is a tool. All of these technologies are emerging. Their true value will, will remain to be seen in the next five to 10 years, but I think that the policy context needs to be much more robust. Um, yeah. Mr. Wu, would you like uh, to add uh, 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 something that has failed to live up to its promise or something that we know we, we hyped too much and didn't, didn't live up to its promise? Uh, and just now, 
As you've mentioned, how the consumers are helping with the environment protection, well, in my opinion, what is more important is how the international organization can play a better role. Previously, maybe as the limitation of technology, however, uh, with the current technological progress, uh, the internet development, and also the international collaboration, uh, we are able to share technologies and share solutions, and this will be a very important mechanism for us to establish, and that is the governments of different countries need to uh, start taking actions to protect the environment and preserve the resources. Well said. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So before we do our close-up, we have about 10 minutes so we can ask questions from the audience. The more provocative, the better. Please <laughs> keep it in the form of a question, however. And um, please introduce yourself and say uh, where you're from. Uh, my name is Carsten Otto. I come from Germany, from the Kaizen Institute. We have a lot of projects also in the food industry. And I have a question to Ms. Ramanan. <laughs> in our official... Uh, and, um, App here from the World Economic Forum is a small CV from you, and I have a question for the last sentence. I think you know it. Uh, I'm a fan uh, from from fish restaurants, yeah, and uh, I quote: you, "You write aspires to open a social enterprise restaurant one day." <laughs> it means what is it, and what is the difference between? Your restaurant, your dream, and uh, a normal one, like Nordsee in, in Germany. Okay, yeah, such a, an absolutely a question I was not expecting in <laughs> any form whatsoever. That was my uh, supposed to be fun fact. I, I guess the definition of a social enterprise is where you reinvest a certain proportion of your profit in furthering some social or environmental objective. So prior to starting Impact Vision, I started a social enterprise catering company and the social enterprise component is providing opportunities to migrant and refugee women to um, enable them to become chefs. So we also have certain um, commitments that we've made around sourcing. We source the vast majority of our products locally and sustainably. We work with local fishmongers, for example. And a friend of mine actually started a box scheme. So she works directly with local fishermen and delivers the fish to community hubs uh, in London. And we source our fish from there. So I would say that... The main difference is that you explicitly state that a certain proportion, we in fact invest all our profits in furthering the social or environmental objective. And in the, in the future, I would love to open a, open a restaurant around that, but this is um, a, an amazing question, one I was really not expecting. <laughs> Thank you. The question is, you started three businesses. Hurry up and tell us about your fourth one. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to read my CV, please don't. <laughs> Um, I didn't keep track of who raised their hand next, so I will let you guys sort this out amongst yourselves in the crowd. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gao Yuan. I come from Cuba, uh, Tianyang Shipping. I'm the president of the company. And uh, I have two questions. One is uh, to Ms. Ma Hamor, and uh, the other one I want to speak in Chinese to Mr. Wu. Uh, the first one, you know, we are a shipping company, and one of our most important services is the, from the fishery from South Pacific to Asia, like to China, to Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and, uh, and Japan. Uh, you know, the volume is very big and uh, keeping increasing by every month. Every month, we have a lot of fish in our refrigerator container to, to, to Asia. Uh, I know you are the export of the, the sea, so I, my question is that uh, oh. <laughs> how long do you think uh, the, the volume can still increasing? Or in other words, uh, uh, after how many years do you think uh, the quantity can reach the peak? How many years of fishing do we have left? How many years of increase do we have left? Yeah, we are still uh, increasing, but uh, my question is that uh, how long do you think the increasing can still lasting? Oh, that's a tough question. Not long. <laughs> <laughs> the question is how much longer do we have before our fisheries really max out and we really run out of fish? I think that the we're getting better technology to catch more fish, which helps us catch more, but it also means that we cut from... We went from spending the interest and now we're spending the capital. So the question is kind of like how much money is left in the bank. It's not, 
there, it, we're, the question isn't, you know, how, how many years can I live off the interest? Now the question is like, how many years before I've depleted the whole, the whole fund? So my answer is, um, if we back up a little bit and go back to just spending the interest, we can, we can fish forever. Good answer. Uh, <laughs> the second question. Uh, 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 I'm just Wu Zong. the moderator here. <laughs> 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 okay, my question to Mr. Wu is that you are very famous, as well as your company is very famous in China. We all buy your product. So my question is, for your company, do you have some strategies to go out, to go international? For our company, we started to go out in 19... 87 in Mauritius, and then we went to Peru in Angola, in Morocco, in Mauritania, uh, Guinea, uh, Guinea Bissau, and Indonesia, and also some of the uh, Pacific eye areas. And later on, uh, we have some structural change within the company, so we have shifted from the uh, fish catching stage to the fish cultivation. And therefore, we've got uh, the uh, fish cultivation uh, platform in Halifax, Canada. And also in Japan, we had the processing factory to work with local people. And also in Korea, we started uh, our cultivation center. And apart from it, uh, we've also got our presence in uh, USA, in uh, Hong Kong, in the Taiwan and the other regions. We set up some trading uh, platforms. And you know, for these trading platforms, in the very beginning, we emphasized uh, on exporting. And currently, this is a very good hub for exporting and importing. So we're basically choosing the best locations of the world to choose the best product and the best market. And in the future, I think going out, going international uh, is a very good echo of China's national initiative of Belt and the Road. And at the same time, we believe that it is very important for us to go out even further and also cooperate with local people. We have time for one more question, if it's a tidy, quick question. Then we'll wrap um, it up. Have a question for Mr. Wu. Okay, I've got a question for Mr. Wu. Uh, I'm from the CRI. And we know that uh, the fisheries, uh, the, uh, it's uh, very dependent on weather. So how can you control or manage this risk? Thank you. For our business, for the fishery, previously we talked about uh, the volume, how much we can get. And uh, I believe uh, your question is something we should understand. And I think that is the risk, and the risk is something we need to think about as the top priority. Because for all kinds of industries, all kinds of businesses, uh, risk is something you need to manage. Otherwise, no company can thrive. And for our company, we have a lot of lessons. We've learned it in the hard way. But at the same time, we've got some measures to uh, counter with these risks. And this year, we've got uh, 11 measures, for example, some of the alarming system, the prevention system, because we've got many experts to have some uh, forecast uh, of the conditions in the water and uh, from the weather. And uh, secondly, as for the insurance, you know, for any type of uh, companies that will risk, uh, you will be able to find the opportunity to cooperate with insurance company. And that gives us a very good guarantee for the further development. And uh, the third point I want to make is that uh, you need to know what you can do. And you do the things within your capability. Do not overdo something. So I believe so 
no matter you call it the lessons or the experience, uh, we believe that based on these, we would be able to get a sustainable and developed track of development so that we can pay back to our consumers, to our investors, and uh, all the people uh, focused on our company. Thank you very much. Be, uh, be disciplined in what you do and know what, know what you can do and do what you can do. So let's see, we just have a couple of minutes to wrap up. Um, what I'd like to do is ask each of the panelists to just describe um, a take home or an insight or uh, something that they'll take away from this conversation um, for the rest of the forum. Mr. Wu, would you like to start? We're putting you on the spot again. <laughs> Well, first of all, I believe is the risk of the fishery, and uh, that is very important. The things to remember, and secondly, that is uh, the fisheries development in China is now in the very crucial transitional period, and how can we? How can we uh, produce more sustainable development method without uh, over capturing the marine animals or over expand our productions? And that is the key for sustainability. So it's, a, it's a thin line that we walk. We're trying to do more without tipping over a line. And Ms. Ramadan, what, what is your key take home or your uh, key insight that you'll be leaving with? Yeah, um, well, firstly, it's been such a pleasure to share a panel with you both. Thank you so much for having me. And I think it's interesting that across academia and very kind of large private sector and uh, small service provider that we're all fairly united in understanding that technology is a tool, but international, national, and regional cooperation is extremely important to address issues like overfishing. And we need to work on having a very firm um, policy context within which technologies are implemented. And I think this point was echoed by all of us, so I think that's probably the main thing that I'll take away with me. Absolutely. Yeah. If there's there's this, this sort of speaking to your point as well about the, the number of different opportunities in fisheries around the world. We have a chance to have a, of a truly global economy in fisheries that's also behaving in a disciplined way and making disciplined policy decisions. And, and it's actually quite an opportunity where the technology is now ready. Uh, it's ready for all the diplomats and the politicians to firmly commit to the discipline and the careful walk down the line so that we're not slipping past what we can harvest and slipping into a point where we start going backwards. So it's the, the technology is here, and now it's time for the, the political discipline to kick in. I'm now hungry for scallops. We are hungry for tuna, <laughs> scallops, and some wahoo sashimi. Um, so thank you guys all for joining us here at the forum and online. Um, before I have you give an applause for the panel, I'd also just like to thank our translators. They did a very excellent job um, keeping us all on the same page. Um, so please join me in thanking our panelists, and thanks very much.